Hi there, my name's Eli. I'm in Vancouver, Canada. I'm one of the co-hosts of this CMX chapter for chapter organizations and user groups. And the idea for this event came from actually the CMX Industry Awards. Basically, they gave me a list of here are the top nominated community managers in this sector. And I said, one, I should know all these people because I want to steal all their great ideas and best practices. And two, I bet that would make for a fascinating conversation to take some of these more experienced community managers working in our particular segment of the world, which is basically that place where we facilitate and enable others who are creating their own communities, um, whether that's through in-person or online chapter events or through forums. But basically the idea is we're all here because we aren't always necessarily the direct point for the end users of our community, but rather we're supporting like chapter leaders and people who are managing their own subsections of the community. Of course, our panelists today are some of those really smart people, one of whom is actually the founder and co-host of this group as well, which is Tally. So I'm going to actually put each of you on and just give you about two minutes to do a really quick intro. Just like tell us you who you are and like one piece of hot gossip we should know about you. Tally, I'm going to put you on the spot first because here you are as the founder of this chapter. Thank you. And thank you for not letting me in advance about the gossip stuff. So I'm only to make up something right now. So hi everyone, welcome. My name is Tali Vasilevsky. I live in Israel and I'm a community manager at Elementor, which is a leading website builder platform in the WordPress uh, ecosystem. And I'm leading the meetups program in Elementor. And this is the reason I had the, the need to find more people that are doing the same um, as I and get learn more, share knowledge, and uh, exchange ideas. And we started this uh, chapter April last year, which is like amazing that it's almost a year. And I had gossip. Um, so Danny is here, and Danny is um, from Bevy, and we have a very nice relationship. We are started to work with Bevy this year, and it's not a promotion because it's just, just a a coincidence, but I really like uh, working with him and I want to say to him thank you for all the support that they're giving us in the last and very hard year. Jasmine, do you want to continue? Sure. So my name is Jasmine. I am a, I guess I'll start with my gossip. I am actually going to be <laughs> changing roles. So I guess you guys are the first to hear the gossip. I'll be the interim executive director of Thicketia starting this month or today. And our community is a community of Latinx or Latino identifying tech professionals. So we give everyone a little place to call home outside of their company. And I am joining you guys from New York area. Also did not realize there were so many European attendees. I totally would have been fine changing the time of this. So apologies, but thank you for joining at night. I know I have my best thoughts at night, so this might work out. Awesome. And I'm always delighted when I hear that someone from a community orientation steps into a leadership role within an organization. So that to me is just like such a, a good sign of where we as an industry are going and congratulations. Thank you. I'm excited. Yeah. So I'm Corina. I'm based in Romania. I'm based, not necessarily, usually you say the capital or the big city, given the, the pandemic, I moved in a remote village, so I'm a village. I'm the director of the UiPath community or global community. The UiPath community is dedicated to developers and business users that, that want to, to automate with the help of the UiPath platform. So it's quite an exciting space for us on the gossip not sure how much is of a gossip but i do i do have a community i could say of five dogs <laughs> so <laughs> i'm quite into this type of communities also not just only with uh, human interaction but also with uh, quite so many puppies and dogs so i have a pack of huskies but also stray dogs from the street 
careful, we're going to force you to bring one of those dogs up on camera and show off a little bit. It, it might happen. So that's a good thing. So they might appear here. Hey, we want to play with you. It's already late. So what are you doing? So good that I shared this. <laughs> awesome. So we all have communities in different spaces. Just to give us all a sense of like where we're all coming from, I'd love to hear from each of you really quickly. Where is like the primary place for your community, whether that's a forum, whether those are in chaptered events, and also how you do, how's the community feeling right now? Is it struggling? Is it rocking? Love to get a quick sense of that. Jasmine, you first. Where is that community action happening and, and how's it doing? Actually, we just lost uh, Jasmine. I'm sure she'll be on her way back. Tally, over to you. Yeah. Where is okay. the action happening and how are they doing? So I will just like it, uh, take it one step back. As I shared, I'm responsible for our meetups program, but our community exists on, of course, on online. We have community hub, which is like the, the place we call for forum and the events platform for the meetups. We have uh, official global online and a Spanish, Spanish official Facebook group as well. And we, I have like colleagues that are taking care of the, these activities. So I think that for us, it's been, like I said, a year of transition uh, because two years ago, COVID started and we have a very specific plan of growing our meetups in, in Europe and really owning and taking, like creating official communities for the local, for some local countries. And then COVID happened and everything went online and we got a lot of like stuff from leaders. Okay. What, like how? Okay, we're doing online, but what's the difference between a Madrid meetup and Sevilla meetup and like Munich meetup and Berlin meetup? Like, what's really the difference if it's everything online? And people from India started attending US events and vice versa. So it's like everything got a mishmash. And then last year, we tried to understand, okay, so how we can predict what to do and specifically in the meetups program, like how do I take this? challenge and still not losing all the um, in-person groups, all the in-person engagement um, that's coming out uh, from this. And mm -hmm. it is a challenge, it was a challenge. And we decided to move with like to take the time that we've had and to switch our uh, Meetup program and website. We were using Meetup.com and we moved to one is that is branded Elementor and it's part of the hub, as I mentioned, which took a lot of effort and resources and restructure. And we needed to give support to leaders, uh, explain them why they're doing this. And this took a lot of, which in, in that, in, in the meantime, I was encouraging leaders to collaborate from the same country, from global, and the focus was less, less local, but it's more about community. So you can just collaborate and create as more content, as more engagement with your um, audience, even if they're not really in your city. So this is what like, this is state with now again we are rethinking and understanding what is going to be this year and hopefully uh, we will continue to grow locally as well yeah and i think this is a story i'm hearing from a lot of community managers who had location-based chapters does that even make sense in this new era and if so how do we differentiate that from the more global webinar programs that many of us have been running historically as well and I think we should dig into that a little bit more. For Karina, for you at UiPath, where is where does the community live? What spaces do we find them? Yeah, so we do have one main hub for them, community.uipath.com, where they can find everything that we, we have to offer for them. The, the moment when we created the community, when naturally the community started, it started on the forum. So our forum is there family so for especially for the ones who are already in our community for some time they do talk about the forum as where the, their family is if they are beginners for most uh, the the main space is the the academy so they start by by uh, learning more before i know being able to speak up a bit more into the forum or start networking more with the others 
So we do offer to, to them, like we offer the product, we offer the academy, the forum, and then we take them into events, meetups, local ones, global ones, regionals, competitions in terms of hackathon. So exactly, this is the, the main hub where they can find out about all the programs that we have to offer, all the possibilities for them to contribute, everything in, in one place. Oh, this is actually remarkable. Speaking of jealousy, I'm really jealous of this really clear page that sort of brings together all of your different community engagement options. This is really well done. And I'm going to put the link into the chat as well. Perfect. This is built on uh, on Bevy. So as a tool behind, this is on uh, on Bevy. And uh, the, the, I later I can share a bit more. We started using our own hub and our own like the Bevy module and everything when COVID started. So it was quite difficult to to do that. <laughs> but we can share. Awesome. And thank you, Jasmine, for your return. Where do we find your community these days? Are they all, are they meetup.com? Are they in forums? Where do we actually find you, this community? Yeah. I'm um, sorry about that. So we are predominantly hosted in Slack, which isn't the best for community, but it really works for our community in the sense that our members don't have to leave something they're familiar with. Majority of our members are already using Slack and they love it there. And then information on joining our community and getting further involved within the community is found on our webpage. So anyone can join our web, our community. The, yep. And then anyone is also able to further discuss things once they're in the community. We have a lot of locals channels and that's where you'll see all of our chapters congregating. And then we have quite, honestly, we have way too many channels to think of, but we have identity based channels and things of that nature, but our chapters are predominantly located by like cities. Right. And right now our applications have been on hold or closed due to the pandemic for starting chapters or becoming chapter leaders, but we are going to be starting to reintroduce those this year. Fabulous. So speaking of those chapters, we often have this discussion about what is it that we actually bring to the table to keep specifically our chapter leaders engaged and, and active. So I'd love to hear from each of you. If you were to think about the things you provide to your chapter leaders, what is the top most important thing that you actually bring to your chapter leaders that you think is, is like the reason they, they stick around, that you have retention and, and continued engagement? Tally, why don't I go with you first? What do you think is like the number one thing you're able to provide your chapter leaders? Um, I think the connect, the personal connection to, to us, the company, to the HQ, to stakeholders. I was holding last year monthly meetings with our meetup organizers. And we are also having like bi-monthly webinars with stakeholders in the company that are sharing initiatives, new products, updates. And like also meetings with person, like it's not personal, but it is like an intimate session with the CEO when the leaders can ask questions and even an anonymous uh, ask me anything because we want them to understand the why we're doing things, to ask the hard question, to give us real feedback. And we're encouraging, encouraging them to do that and also really taking their feedback um, to the department and the stakeholders. And also we're starting like more focused product session this year with because it's, they're asking this and we understand that they need more like deeper inside information from the people that are actually um, developing the product to really understand and connect. And for them, it's making them easier and comfortable to also share with, with the, uh, the members of their communities during the events and like why things are happening and right. how does things work. So it's also on the strat strategy thing, they are involved, like know from first hand and also like getting a ready kit presentation and everything also something that they're helping them on the operational side. So access sounds like it's the number one thing of value you can bring access to get a sense of what are the decision making in the future of Elementor and also access to start helping drive the direction of the product in the program. 
Karina, how about you? What do you offer the chapter leaders that you think is the thing that, that keeps them there? So it's access quite a lot. So the permission for them to build something like we feel like they become co-creators with us, starting something new, like that local space is not yet uh, taken by someone. They want, they have a vision to develop a network there. So we offering the platform, having this conversation with them, it's a way of starting the co-creation of it. So that's the, the first thing. Then we take them into a bit of coaching. So each uh, regional community manager has a conversation with them just to understand why do they want to start the chapter? What's in it for them? If they do have the skills, because uh, especially when things were in person, uh, it's one thing to have the passion for the product and being a techie, but then it's also about being able to organize things, getting a bit into event planning to say logistics and all that. So making sure that they do have all the skills, a bit of presentation skills, a bit of organizing event, and then the, the tech and uh, the tech skills. If they are not the main speakers, at least to know how to build the network, to find the, the right speakers for their meetups. We do offer them a, a playbook. We developed in a, a playbook where they have all the pieces, like they do have templates, how to send the first emails, what topics they can have for the first events. This is based on what we learn from others and so on. Once they join, they can also join some uh, dedicated sharing sessions for chapter leaders where they can learn from each other and where we can also uh, start the conversation uh, with them, give them the latest in terms of products, any developments that happen, any com campaigns that we plan for them. So it's then they stick for the this network that we have for chapter leaders and also when they see where they are getting their achievements in their local group. And given the, the context where we are right now, they do know that we have some regional or, or global chapters and they are in charge for the local ones. So they are in charge for building that network with their, with their locals. Awesome. And Jasmine, obviously you're still in the relaunch phase right now, but when you think historically about what has been most valuable to those chapter leaders, what, what has it been? Yeah. So we still do have some chapter leaders who are still engaged, but I do think intrinsic motivation is like a big hmm. telltale sign of what makes or what has seen shown success for a chapter leader. Um, we are like a traditional community in the sense that we aren't really endorsing a product. We aren't congregating over anything of that nature, but it's really those one-to-one -one, like human connections. So the most successful and like the most motivated chapter directors have been the folks who really enjoy like filling that void that they have may have experienced in their journey into tech for other people. So a lot of them enjoy offering that connection or like that safe space, that feeling of encouragement for other people. And we try and also support them in that kind of opportunity and then it goes without saying i do think all of these kind of leads and different positions are a great resume booster so i do think a lot of folks who either are exploring their own kind of career path or career trajectory utilize roles like this to just get more familiar with the like landscape of technology awesome we are getting a whole bunch of questions coming in through the chat. So let's see if we can quickly touch a couple of those um, before we move back into the set questions. So one of those questions is, I think this touches all of us, how do you decide on the cities you want to have chapters in? Do you have a strategy around that? Or is it just if someone asks, we look at it? Karina, how about you? Is there an idea around how you select cities? It's a mix on our end. So some of the chapters started because internal colleagues wanted them for business reasons, for uh, seeing that the market is growing. So we supported them in that. Some others, because our community wanted to develop in that specific area, we saw potential, they started, they, they were active, so we wanted to build. And this took us like right now, we have more than seven, 75 chapters uh, all across more than 70 cities. 
So it, it started when we don't know if we need to go into a city or if that chapter leader doesn't know yet if it's committed or not. What we do is that we help them develop an event in a hidden chapter. And after they decide if they want to go with the second, if there is any vibe from the community, and if they want to go for the second and third, that's the moment when we also enable them to, to have their own chapter and develop that. So it's a mix from the business, from the community. And then if we are not sure, we do this testing with the hidden. Right. Actually, the testing is very interesting. I'd like to come back to that at some point. But so Jasmine, on your side of things, has there been any like strategy on how you select cities or is it just if someone says yes, let's do it? So I think at one point that may have been the motivation a few years back, especially now since, and I just answered Lauren's question, there was a period of dormancy or just fallout with the pandemic of leadership and like of chapter directors. So right now we're looking at data to lead these decisions. So looking at member data and like where people are joining from and why, and then supporting with a relaunch of chapters in those targeted cities. So if you are in technology, you may have noticed that some folks are moving from the West coast into different cities like Miami or mm. different parts of Texas. So we actually relaunched our Miami chapter a few months back and it was awesome. And it's been taking off really well. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that so many people and so many new voices and personalities are down there looking for community. Great. And on your side, Tali, what's your strategy? It's two. It's if you come and you want to do a meetup uh, in your local city, you just need to go to the application, be everything that is in the press application, and we will have a chapter. And if you want me, I can elaborate now on the process or later. We'll come back and, to that later. And the second thing is that we do have a company as a business strategy, like uh, a, a marketing and, and business, where like the community is a um, supporting effort and driving actually when it's coming to community, the driving effort for um, new markets or expanding. So it's also coming from from that. And of course, everyone that wants to open chapters will also have small places on earth. This is fascinating to me that there is actually some chapter development that's happening from the corporate and business development side of things. I will say in my experience, those chapters always fail for me um, because you need such strong intrinsic motivation of a local chapter lead, Yasmin was talking about, to succeed because leading a chapter is frankly a big ask. It's a, it's a large mm -hmm. piece of work. And so I'm impressed that others are, are able to succeed in that because I would say I've largely failed at that. Tally, back to you. There's a question here which said was, why not Meetup Pro? Why did you decide to move off of Meetup during this COVID time? I replied to Tara, actually, we have, uh, we still have like a pro network uh, on meetup.com, uh, which we had before COVID, but what we realized with the growth of the community, the growth of the company, and also with COVID that meetup.com wasn't, we needed like an other experience because like I mentioned, people want to just online, they event by topic, not by region, not by even like language, just the topic. And it's something that um, at least a year ago wasn't, wasn't been able to see on me that I wasn't able to see that. Like I needed to go to the dashboard. Okay. But not something that our users, we wanted to create quickly online events, collaboration, some things I know that meetup Common are doing today. It's next our online space, which was back then, uh, like Google, but we were building the forum. We wanted to connect these parts. So this is the reason we said, okay, we want to do something to choose another tool that will give us more opportunities that we can have like global, um, HQ events. And it's not related to location. Like we wanted to disconnect from the location assets in, in, in the COVID, um, uh, it's, it's heart and soul comes out of location. Yeah. Yeah. And it is amazing, an amazing tool. And I'm sure that it uh, will benefit us in the future. I want to mention one think Elijah about what you mentioned spreading specific cities when you need it in general I de definitely agree with you like we started I failed in some countries in the U.S. but I can say that our Spanish community we had a major success 
cause and it was driven by local community, local leaders, and also efforts that we made. And we found the people with this connection, we found the people that could really lead um, these um, meetup groups in other cities. And it was very successful before mm -hmm. COVID. Right. Cool. Let's talk a little bit of this question here about, from Tara about budgets. Of the three of you, is anyone actually offering a budget or financial support to local chapter leaders? Jasmine, take it. So in the past, we have had a budget. Uh, I think in general, I feel like community things necessarily may not get the largest budget, uh, which is in line with what ours was. But we are always striving to, one of my big goals, especially last year, was making sure that there was like harmony amongst our chapters and events and things that members could partake in. So we are flexible on certain budgeting to accommodate that because I do think the cost of, for instance, an event in New York may be very different than an event in California. So we do try and fluctuate just so that folks can feel the same kind of harmony and experience, but our chapters do get a annual budget. Cool. Yeah. Another thing I get to be jealous about. Let's talk a little bit about recruitment. So Lauren's saying COVID has put this big discontinuity in a lot of our programs. I know I went from 120 chapters to 20. It was a big gap. And so I've been now finally moving back into recruitment. And so I think we'd love to just hear from the three of you. What is for your chapter program, your top source of recruitment? Where did the people come from? Karina, why don't you go first? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like recruiting chapter leaders, right? Or Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. Um, when COVID started, like, just like I said, like before COVID, we were in person with most of the things, but we weren't at this uh, volume where we are right now. With uh, going online, this was an opportunity for our audience, for our community members, because most of them are developers. So they needed a different set of skills now. They just needed their laptop and their passion for the product, like just to be there with the others, share, help others, demoing stuff. So it was much easier not to go into logistics, not to go into they need catering, they need the location, uh, and all the, the trouble of a uh, small event organizer. So this was an opportunity for the ones who were techie to, to get into this role, to onboard. So we do find them in our community. We have all the time they can access a, a form where, can they, where they can write to us that they want to become a chapter leader. Mm -hmm. If not, the in our network, so we participate in some events or to, to some of our events, some of them start to, to build more of a conversation with us. We have advocacy programs, so out of those advocates, we guide them, we coach them, we want to learn what they want to do as advocates. And some of them, they do want to associate themselves with their local network, so we help them do that. So... We have these opportunities, but the, it was key in a way that we went into online and we will keep it like we will keep online while also moving back to in person with some. So depending on the conditions. So when you look at your chapter leaders, do they tend to come from people who had existing relationships? Maybe they were in your advocacy program, maybe they were in the forums, or are they people who came directly into the chapter leadership application form? And that was like their first major interaction with you in the community mm. sense. No, and I don't think it makes sense for them to do that. Like first they want to explore, they do need to, to understand the products. Like the key and the fun is to, to understand the community and then to want to contribute to it. It's not like just becoming a chapter leader as the, this isolated objective for them. Right. It, it, they right. will not be su sustained. They will not have a network. So it's not helping them or us. Yeah. Interesting. Cool. And for you, Talia, where is the primary source of new leaders coming from? So it's a combination of leaders that are applying because online event of another group, which is not in their location. And then mm -hmm. they say, okay, I want like the, the craziest thing. I had uh, somebody from the Silicon Valley attending a, a meetup in like East Asia. 
which is really crazy, and then applying, which is very good. And we did had some in the last um, two years coming from this type of event. Also network from existing leaders. We have like promotion on our website, on the events, on emails we're sending to uh, every meetup. We have the footer in saying that if you want to open your own chapter, contact us. And we're trying, but it's not working like perfect. It's we need always to be very uh, proactive about that. And it's Drupal's the it, when we're not promoting this, it's like very slow Drupal. And on the application form, we have a question: How did you heard about for? Because we do want to learn where from people are coming. And so far, that answer it sounds like it's largely people who went to a prior event and understood at least what does it look like? What, what do they have to deliver? Yeah. Or there's somebody told them you need to host a meetup to promote yourself professionally. Mm. Like they heard somebody saying to them, what do you need to grow your uh, reputation to build your personal brand? And they were going to look for, okay, I'm building website. I'm using Elementor. Interesting. Can I do something? use it to elevate throughout the community. Interesting. Karina, are you seeing the same thing? Do you have like consultants and people who work on top of your platform hosting events as part of like their business and reputation development? Just a few. So there are not that many, but that's the, the good thing is that we have that conversation with each of them to make sure we understand uh, the needs, to make sure that it, it, they are uh, in this for the long run, uh, if we really can help them by being a chapter leader, like it's not just for the fun and the, it's not like it's that much of glam, it's tech. They need to go into the demo stuff and all those things. They need to really enjoy it. Yeah. And I think we do have the, the privilege to have good um, advocates. So they are setting the role models a bit. So if they see those guys and girls, they want to go into that and they get that it needs to be real. You cannot just do step some go into some steps just because yeah so i've definitely seen what tally described which is uh i have someone who you know basically was like johnny appleseed new chapters as he would move to each new city he would start up a new chapter build a new leadership team around him and then move on to the next, next city so he went from like dc to philly to portland those are like you know the, the real power builders within my community they're helping form new chapters. And for you, Jasmine, where are you finding your people? We do require that our applicants are a member of our community for a minimum six months, I think. And I think that has to do really with the just making sure that there is a sense of like fit and folks are doing it for the right reasons. Because I do agree with Karina, like it isn't a glamorous job. And I think if you are just doing it to have a title or to lead something, you won't have a long running <laughs> or you'll feel exhausted. So we want to make sure that like you understand your community. I think at one point, and we're working through the kinks of what this next run of applications will look like. But I think at one point we did require them to do a few informal things prior to launching a channel. Mm -hmm. And I actually really like that idea. I have a chapter director that recently shared his opinion that you have to have some experience with events or like organizing, even if it's a dinner party, that would help. And I agree because I do think there's a lot of small little things that you might just forget or you may think, oh, a virtual event's so easy. There's no worries here. And it's a lot harder than you would think. And you have to be prepared to represent the company or represent the organization. So we want to make sure whoever's coming into these roles does understand what they're getting into. So you both have touched in on one of my absolute favorite discussions around building chapter communities, which is what are your barriers to entry? to like be, actually become a full-fledged chapter leader. So it sounds like for you, Jasmine, you've got a six months, and if they haven't been around for six months and they haven't stuck for that, they're not even gonna start the entry. But it sounds like for you, Karina, there is a test event process that people need to go through. Tally, in your world, what kind of barriers to entry do you have before you'll let someone become a full-fledged chapter leader? after applying uh, like in the application process they have like terms and conditions of the program that 
hopefully they are reading and approving uh, because it, it can conflict with their goals with their with leading a meetup group and then we have a video call and the next step is that they need to prepare a plan for the for three events uh, like agenda date everything which i'm saying that it's not obligating but they i want to to see how they think if they have the right sense of the right set of mind what are the topics and sometimes uh, people just don't apply and just say like, vanish which is okay you're not ready mm -hmm. you don't have time whatever good um or they're suggesting things that are not exactly what we had in mind in this case i'm like trying to like give them an example a suggestion and sometimes they're proceeding and sometimes not unfortunately there are people that are submitting plans and opening a chapter for them and then they're just like disappearing mm -hmm. um and but I'm, i don't feel that i have the privilege of denying people from getting to this stage it's interesting with the test because i do have to create chapter for them and help them like get the first like we are helping to get the first people in it's interesting to see how we can this yeah i find that fascinating too because i also like you tally sometimes will fire up a new chapter because someone's jumped through all my standard hoops, which helps me identify most of the hardcore people, but sometimes it still doesn't get there. So I think having a chapter that's just, this is for your first event. And so you need to actually deliver fully before we'll even create a new chapter is a really interesting idea. You know, we're all going to be stealing your smarts. Count on that. So we're now moving into the last 15 minutes and and I think it's time for us to start talking about metrics and KPIs, which I see has also been something that Laura has also been surfacing. So here's my first question around KPIs. For you, in your role as a community manager, what is your most important KPI? The measure of success that you look at and say, if this is going in the right direction, I'm succeeding. Jasmine, what, do you want to start first with what is, what's most important to you? I really think I look for more qualitative data, which I know is hard, but it is what really matters the most. I love to see when members, so primarily I would say our members are joining either for community or job support. So if a member comes in for just job support, which is the case, sometimes they might disappear after. But I love seeing when members are offering their help to other folks. So like reversing the model and giving back their time or their expertise. That's like my favorite. <laughs> I do look at some internal kind of metrics that we measure. So we have Slack analytics that'll show us like number of messages, number of invites, number of members that are joining. Obviously growth is great. We have grown almost 100% from month to month over the pandemic in comparison, but I like to see like how many of those members are active. So activity versus numbers only. Right. And that comes, I think actually to Laura's question, which is just the engagement metric. Engagement is, is a soft, squishy, hard to define thing. But for you, what do you think is a good proxy in your community for engagement? So we've had to really expand what we consider engagement. I think traditionally you might think commenting and like sharing things on posts and things of that nature might be considered engagement only, but we also have a high population of people who love react cheese and think of it, thinking of it, if you're at work and this is just your community, I always react to things. So I take that into account. So looking at that as another kind of form of engagement is important. Right. Cool. And Tally, on your side of things. What's it look like for your community? What do you think is most important for you when you look at metrics? So when speaking for metrics for, for meetups, for events and not online spaces. So I actually like to look at the feedback and the satisfaction rate from attendees. It's based on surveys that uh, we send after each event. And for me, if like it's a high, high satisfaction rate, that means doing, getting their, their getting the to the goal they attended the event which meaning that it should help also the this grow that mm -hmm. means that this the leader is doing a great job so i like this 
if I need to use one KPI, so this is one that I like because I think that it's setting the trend. If I'm seeing the numbers are not good, I know that something is not is not well and I need to look in. And of course, accept that as Jasmine mentioned, um, we are looking at active active members that in in uh, in the program, it's actually the number, the percentage of people that are um, are recipient to events uh, per per quarter and the people mm -hmm. that are returning um, to events. So this is also something that I can learn about the health um, of the program in general. Right. Really interesting. So is it basically, what is the exact wording of that key survey question? Is it like, did this event help you achieve your goals or how do you phrase that? So to make it easier, we have a survey after each event and we are having a half have your survey with a deeper, like much more questions with what are your goals? Are you achieving them? The, the survey after event, it's one question. How do you, it's uh, what is, what is your, I need to look on the Bevy dashboard. Sorry, I don't remember exactly, but it's similar to what you will get after this event from CMX. Right, right, the, right. the same uh, in general, the same, and then like shows um, that reason and I'm going over the comments. Like I'm really looking at the end of the month, I'm taking out the report and I'm going because I want to see what are people saying. So I think a really key question, which is to say, did the attendees like basically achieve, get out of the event, what they need to succeed in, in their career, in their mission, basically, why did they register? Did they get what they needed from the event? I think that's super interesting. Karina, how about for you? What is that number one metric? We do look into how many chapters are active because that says something about the chapter leaders and how they interact with their networks. Uh, so we go for that. Something that like I, I do have regional community managers that take care of, of each region and the chapter leaders in their region. And something that um, we switched a bit and it's quite related with the business also. So when it's about the meetups that my colleagues run, we do look for having high attendance, so making sure that we have relevant campaigns for people to join. So presence, it's important. But at the end of the quarter, for me, it's more important to understand from the total number of events, of the total number of meetups that we managed to run, how many are being run by the community. So I'm not pushing my colleagues to run more events. It's better to run just a few, but mm. them to have the time to coach the chapter leaders to run more. So this is something that uh, it's helping us also in terms of business mindset when we look at the community. Like It's not that much. I, I will never push my colleagues to do more events rather than I will invite them more to be with the chapter leaders and unlock the potential of the chapter leaders to run events, which means that we have lower participation because they cannot build that high network that we have. They don't have all that, those tools, but if they are there in their local networks, if we build the pace, the habit, that it's much uh, better for everyone. It's healthier for everyone. Right. On the so long you're trying time. to get it to a real sustainable place rather than cheating a little bit by leveraging your own internal mailing lists and things like that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we go quite a lot into that. So let's turn that around now. So after we talked about what we think as community managers is most important. Let's talk about what our boss thinks is most important. Like why does the organization top level invest in community? Like what do they want to see from this? So Karina, back to you. Like what does the organization, what does your boss think is success? Yeah, like the beauty with our company is that everyone supports community. Everyone loves community. And it's from when the company got funded to, to, uh, to the present moment, everyone believes in the power of community. So I do have quite a lot of support. They just want to see more of the things happening because they like the vibe in the community. They just, we go for, for more. So we have full support to hear the voice of the community. If, for example, the community will say, we no longer want chapters, we no longer want to, to meet, I think I can go back and say, guys, we no longer have to do this. Like the community really doesn't want it. It's a healthy uh, dialogue with the community and we do trust them. That is a better situation than some community managers are in. Tally, I don't need you to like tell on tell names or shame anyone, but for your organization, 
what is like the most important thing they get out of community? So again, the, our activities for the community are much more than just the program I'm leading, but in general, I think that is engagement and growth. So it's to see that the, the community is engaged and involved and continuing like to be vocal and, and be a part uh, of the uh, product. And how um, to tie that into business dot goals. Is that so are you able to track through to say like people who attend events are, are better customers or have better retention? Like how do you connect those pieces from the community into the larger business goals? I hope I'm not frozen. Okay. We have it's still in the building, the ability the as we have, um, the login is with the elementary user actually. We're still connecting the data, it's not connected. But we do have the ability to connect and to understand who are these people. Are there like we the, our product is premium, which means like we have free users, customers. So to understand and see over time their retention, if they are like we do have the ability to analyze this. But in this stage, it's still just growing, seeing more and more because the company is growing. Um, we have more um, users. It does need to be reflected in the community, making sure that we are getting everywhere and giving the community support for the growing base of users. And Jasmine, in your world, all you are is community organization. Like, so do you have a different top line measure for what does success look like organizationally? Yes. <laughs> so we have OKRs as an organization. And then we also have right now, as we are like re thinking chapter strategy, we are going to put in some baseline objectives for chapters in general, so they can feel that they are, you know, responsible for certain expectations. And then also, so we can measure kind of success within that community or like that micro community at a local level. But I cool. do. I so we have, I'm uh, sorry, go ahead. Ideas. No, I so said I'm picking up minutes. ideas. So here's one last question from Tara. Basically, you each get about 30 seconds to answer this question. So this is specifically about events and in the community, which is the question is, do you see like community events as a way to do prospecting to basically to bring in potential new customers? Or do you think it really as a way for you to strengthen and build relationships with existing customers of that split? Where do you focus your attention? Is it new customers or deepening engagement with existing customers and, and members of the community. Karina, over to you first. Yeah, uh, we are an open public community, so you don't have to be a customer in order to join. Uh, it, in reality, you have to have an interest on the topic. So you might become and not necessarily customer. You, you can get the skill so you can become employable to, to some customers. So, yeah, and it's, it happens for some to get prospects. This is not what we encourage, but it's happening. If there is a network, people are interested in the business of uh, using your iPad, that can also work. So yeah, right. just to keep it short. <laughs> and Tally, over to you, what's it look like for you? Like, where do you balance that? Is it all new customers or existing strengthening of relationships? The, the official goal is existing, existing users um, and strength, strengthening the relationship. I do know that we have, we are drawing, the meetups are drawing new and potential, but the goal is uh, for existing ones. And Jasmine, in your world, when you look at your event attendees in the chapter program, do they tend to be people who are already existing members or are those events the way you're prospecting and finding new people who want to come and join the larger community in the Slack? I would say maybe 80 to 90% are existing members. And then oh. we may have some like plus ones, which is always nice. And we do encourage them to join. Interesting. Cool. Frankly, we've run out of time, but I have a million other questions for future events. I want to go into like the life cycle of what does it look like if someone comes in and out of being a chapter leader. So we're going to come back and do another event in a month. But super grateful to the three of you here for sharing your expertise for the attendees out there. I will get the video out there and share that with you later. That way you can scrub through and say, what was that genius thing Karina said about halfway through? It'll all be there for you. Otherwise, be sure to join us for our next event in February. And, and otherwise, I'm going to pass it over to Tally for a final goodbye. 
Thank you, everyone. And before we go, we had you shared some amazing resources. And I invite you to do like, maybe we'll do like a thread, the Slack CMX a channel that's called Chapter Programs. So we have resources, for example, for uh, guidebooks and uh, knowledge bases for leaders in one place. So we will do that right now. And don't forget to drop in and add your link if you shared it, just to have this knowledge after this event as well. And see you on February 2nd, when we'll be discussing 2022 goals and objectives. Lovely. And Nicholas, I'm just seeing your note here. I'll include the link to the community Slack with the video when we send our things after the fact. So thank you so much for that reminder. All right. Ciao, ciao. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Have a great evening, evening night. <laughs> bye bye. Bye.